I share what happened sure. to you? Sure. Do you, do you sure. want to share yourself? Yeah, well, I don't exactly know for sure, but we have a pod of five people that we've been together with since March, and we all seem to be very, very careful. The, there's a toddler who's four, and he is in daycare, a very small family daycare where everyone has promised to practice uh, safe uh, precautions. And um, somehow or other, on Monday... Or Sunday night, his father, this past Sunday night, his father presented with a severe headache. And so Monday he went to get a COVID test and found out um, Monday night he was positive. And then the wife and son went, they were positive. And then Paul and I went on Tuesday and we are negative. Now we have been with this family five, six nights a week. I help and we play with the kid and I snuggle with the kid. We're all together. Um, we don't know whether maybe one of the parents first was infected or the kid. Um, the daycare provider and her daughter are ne both negative. Uh, the other children, I think there's seven of them, are supposed to be getting tested too. Um, the parents have very, very mild symptoms. The kid has no symptoms. He's at home, of course, and going <laughs> bonkers. <laughs> but... Um, and we're not seeing we're not seeing them, so we're all isolated with confinement now until I think the twenty second, when we should be um, okay. And, and you guys have again. no symptoms. And the, sort no. of the, the question was, how come? Right. Yeah. So right. Close. And we and, all right. And now, we taste, tested negative so far, but we're not sick. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I think there's still a small chance that, that you could get positive. I think it's really small chance. So I mm -hmm. probably say you probably can even, at least theoretically, if you're tested negative in the last couple of days, you can probably mm -hmm. come out of isolation. I think that's a sort of a one of the new recommendations that you don't have to wait mm -hmm. for the full mm -hmm. 10 days if within five days or at the five day mark, mm -hmm. you had a negative mm -hmm. test. Mm -hmm. Um well, you know, it's a, it, the, I think the reason it's such an important question is, so what percent of people in this situation actually will get infected? It's not even close to 50%. It's something like uh, one, out of, okay. one out of three or four people. Mm -hmm. So it depends on two things. It depends on the ventilation in the room. So if you have a good ventilation <laughs> system going, it drops the risk. And oh. it depends on the <laughs> length, length of exposure. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you were cuddling for five minutes... It's one thing, but if you're in the same space for mm -hmm. days on end, you hours, have hours, car rides, yeah. And my husband and I are, you know, well, he's late sixties, I'm early seventies too, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but we just so still in all like that, for whatever reason, we just didn't. Good. That's, yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> <I'm> thrilled. <laughs> it's uh. Let's just say, thank God that you know. And thank you Not for sharing work. this. Yeah, and thanks for sharing. I think I think it also highlights the fact that it's getting closer to all of us. And so, yes, um, unfortunately, yes. basically, where I'm, how I'm seeing it, we all either going to get the vaccine or get an infection. So mm -hmm. it's it's sort of our choice, or hopefully it will be our choice. Maybe not for everybody, but for most of us. Um, I mean, I think also the vaccine for me is probably way down on the list. Um, I mean, and I'm in California too, where everything is, you know, raging out here. Mm -hmm. uh, ICUs and uh, everything is is full. Um, but uh, you know, we've all—I mean, we've all been so careful. The five of us have been so careful. So you know, I'm thinking the only place it could have come from would have been daycare. But so far. Mm -hmm. We haven't heard anybody else. So who knows, right? right. <laughs> well, knows? thank you so, so much. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, with that, let's start, right? I think it's a good time to start. Yeah, Misha, um, why don't you just introduce our speakers? And it's Nancy and... Mara. Mara. So I think you guys already been introduced more than once. I want to say this may be a third time for Mara and definitely at least second time, if not third time for Nancy. So um, Mara is our um, spiritual director at Center for Integrative Medicine. Uh, Mara is a very, I, I think of Mara as 
if I have any question regarding anything mind, body, spirit, it's Mara. Uh, so Mara also practices all kinds of things, which she can tell you if you're interested, but it's think very broad from reflexology to chaplaincy to Reiki to shamanic healing, all kinds of things. Um, so Mara's going to lead us today in a mind-body practice. And Nancy, of course, you all probably remember, she's uh, our naturopathic doctor. She's um, started out as a part of our center, but you know now she's on her own, but very still closely working with us. Um, and she's going to give us a little bit of a health update. And of course, I'm going to help out with questions. So, and Janet, do you want to say the formal part? No, no, let's, let's just We're go. We're done? All right. Yeah. So everybody, welcome for our weekly GW Office of Integrative Medicine that helps to move education of future clinicians as well as research and clinical work on integrative medicine as well as AIM Health Institute that tries to offer care for underserved in with aspects of integrative medicine in greater DC area. So with that, off to Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Kogan and Janet. Wonderful to see you, Mara, and to see everybody here again. And happy to be here. Um, today, I'm going to cover, um, I'm going to try to not spend too much time, but I, I want to cover some COVID stats in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And then I'm gonna talk about DC's preparation leading up to this vaccine distribution. Um, and then uh, what um, sites are distributing the vaccine in DC. And also a little bit about the, prior the priorities as far as distribution for DC, Virginia, and Maryland, which continue to change. Um, I will be providing Janet with some resources for all of our viewers today um, at the end of this so that maybe um, that can be distributed so that you can, if you're interested, keep up with the changes in um, distribution, location, and, um, and priorities for distribution of, of the vaccine. Um, so to begin with, um, in DC, the most recent stats regarding cases are, we've, ha we've had a total of 26,104 cases since the beginning of um, this COVID pandemic. Um, the, as far as our, the seven day rolling cases, um, we've had daily cases of about 250 a day for again, a seven day rolling average. Um, and that percent change in the last 14 days is about 31%. So it's gone up about 31, 31.8%, almost 32%. And we've had a cumulative um, death toll of 728 with a daily death of, with seven day rolling of, of about two. Um, so when we compare that, now that's relatively low um, compared to Virginia and Maryland. So again, cumulative cases in um, DC about 26,000. Virginia now has hit 292,000 cases um, with uh, daily cases averaging about um, 3,600. And um, the percent change in cases over the last 14 days is about 55%. So we're up about 55% in that. Um, and cumulative deaths have been about 4,500 with a daily death um, average about of 32 for the for seven day rolling average. Um, and then lastly, Maryland, we've had a cumulative uh, case count of about 241,000 um, with a daily case count of about 2,700. And the percent change in cases over 14 days has been about, uh, gone up about 26%. Um, cumulative deaths about 5,200 and a daily death, um, seven day rolling average of 14. So um, I think, you know, we're not surprised the, the rate has increased. We, we are hitting uh, the cold season and we're, uh, we've had a number of holidays as well. So we expected the cases to go up and, and they certainly have. But the good news is that we've got, uh, we've got a vaccine that uh, began to be distributed and administered, actually administered this week across the nation. Um, so as many of you, you've all probably heard of um, Operation Warp Speed, you know, that has delivered on its promise in distributing um, and administering, administering a vaccine. Um, like I said, vaccines began earlier this week. Um, 
uh, as far as uh, being uh, administered. And they are starting with the highest risk po populations and also uh, frontline essential workers. Now, um, the guidance of vaccine distribution is provided by the CDC's Advi Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, also known as ACIP. Um, but each state's order of distribution is going to vary slightly. So I'll be providing Janet with resources for uh, you, depending for you to tap into and and monitor as far as um, distribution is concerned. Um, so um, looking back a bit on DC's preparation, DC. Um, relatively speaking, did well in its preparation. Back in June, um, they began acquiring supplies to administer the COVID-19 vaccine whenever it would become available. And <clears throat> these supplies included um, uh, 184,000 needles, a million alcohol prep uh, pads, a million band-aids, et cetera. Um, and in order to further prepare for the administration of the COVID-19 vaccine, um, DC, Health um, had issued an administrative order on March 13th to modify the scope of practice for certain licensed uh, practitioners um, in order to allow them to administer vaccines and, appropriate, and, and get the appropriate training for, for that, training and su supervision for the um, administration of those vaccines. So currently, um, DC has about 176 provider agreements with hospitals and pharmacies and, and other long-term care facilities and clinics, et cetera. Um, and then these, these specific uh, provider agreements will allow the providers to, uh, at, the, at those specific locations, um, to administer the COVID-19 vaccines in, in the District of Columbia. So in, in DC, there's currently six sites um, that um, will receive that have received DC's initial allotment of vaccines and they um, the reason why these six slots have received them is because they have all of the necessary equipment to store the Pfizer vaccine. Um, the initial allotment is um, 6,825 doses which was delivered in um, uh, in seven boxes that each carry 975 doses. There are six locations. These six locations in DC include the MedStar Washington Hospital Center, Howard University Hospital, uh, George Washington University Hospital, Children's Nat National Hospital, Kaiser Permanente, and MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. And um, just last week, DC Health inspected all of those sites to make sure that they were ready for uh, for administration this week. So um, now these these six sites have also partnered with some healthcare providers across the city, um, and they include um, DC Fire and EMS, um, um, HSC Pediatric Center, the National Rehabilitation Hospital, Psychiatric Institute of Washington, St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Sibley Memorial Hospital and United Medical Center as well. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the DC vaccine prior to prior priority guidelines. Um, the CDC guidelines call for a phased approach, which DC has been following, and um, DC's identified four phases, um, and their phases include phase one A, one B, um, phase two, and phase three. So the big question is, where do, where do each one of us fall in these phases? Everybody's anxious about this va vaccine. So with DC, phase 1A is going to include all healthcare workers and first responders. Um, so that covers about 85,000 people. Um, more specifically, um, the, the scope of people this includes are full and part-time hospital staff, um, nursing and residential care facility employees, outpatient providers, um, home health providers, health care providers in long-term care facilities, pharmacists, emergency service officials, and frontline public health personnel. So um, initial distribution of the vaccine will be tied to settings, um, not roles necessarily. So priority will be given to those who have direct exposure to patients, including, um, you know, the obvious doctors, nurses, techs, front desk workers, and other environmental and support service workers. Um, 
So as we move through phase 1A, um, DC Health and the Office of the Chief Technology Officer are working together to build an online registration system for healthcare workers who work outside of the traditional healthcare setting to register for a vaccine as well. Um, and so th then um, within the phase one, there's also, uh, we just went over phase 1A, there's also phase 1B. And phase 1B is going to include the essential workers and at risk residents with, um, and, and this. Uh, is approximately 310,000 people. So the people this includes are persons that are 65 years or older with a rough head count of about 85,000 for the district. Um, adults 19 to 64 with high risk conditions, it's pro approximately 163,000 people. DC government critical care personnel, law enforcement, um, Department of Corrections residents and staff, residential care community residents, nursing home residents, um, grocery store employees, childcare providers and staff, school teachers and staff as well. And then phase two will be um, the rest of any of the phase one populations that did not receive the, the, uh, the vaccine and the general public. And finally, phase three will include the general public. So, um, so, DC, I feel like uh, DC and Virginia have done a pretty good job on um, on releasing the information as far as distribution and um, priorities for the vaccine. Um, as far as Virginia, um, the the best information that I could find was that we know um, phase one A will include the healthcare workers and long term care residents. Um, there's and they gave a, a head count of approximately um, how many people in what categories this includes. So we have healthcare workers, which are at about 170,000, 70,000 employees whose duties will include access to clinical settings where they could potentially be exposed, um, and about 43,000 that are other healthcare personnel who will interact with patients who are not necessarily high risk for or or known to have COVID, and about 158 thousand will be administered at long-term care um, facilities. So this includes nursing homes, um, assisted living, residential care communities, um, state veteran homes, et cetera. Um, and then for Maryland, um, as of now, what I know is that phase 1A of the vaccine is going to focus on critical health care workers, long-term care facilities, and first respond responders. Um, and um, the state has also signed up all of the state's 227 nursing homes and uh, six, uh, roughly 1,700 assisted living facilities for the federal distribution partnership through both CVS and Walgreens for the vaccine. And that's all I have today. Thank you, Nancy, so much. I just have a couple of things to add just as a local experience from GW. Um, well, first of all, we are unfortunately starting to head toward back uh, with numbers as what it looked like in the spring. So hospital is up to 40 plus patients by now, about half uh, in ICU and half on the general medicine ward. So I think vaccine can come at any more um, important time. Um, hospital, well, we don't call it hospital, we call it University Enterprise, have gotten uh, about a thousand vaccine out of, um, I think approximately 8,000 or 7,000 that came to DC. But luckily, um, uh, Enterprise also got uh, quite a lot of doses from DC, from Maryland and Virginia side, because a lot of the uh, physicians and nurses and healthcare providers and even admin staff w live in Maryland or Virginia. So, you know, I think th that's a that's a good news for the enterprise. So I think it sounds like the, the way I see it, you know, I, I used to say in the previous meetings that I was expecting uh, first wave to be finished sometime by late February. I think that it looks like things may move faster than that, which is great because it's possible that you know, everybody will have a chance of getting vaccine, you know, a little bit sooner. So maybe even before mid spring. So I think that's 
maybe a little too optimistic, but probably not that far off of the reality. So, I mean, hopefully everybody by that point will have a good personal sense whether they're going to do it or not. And as I said, I don't think we have a lot of choices. We're either all going to get a vaccine or we're going to get the disease. So let's go straight to questions um, so that we give Mara plenty of time. So Misha, it looks like the first question um, is, does the Moderna vaccine have PEG or other questionable ingredients in terms of reactions? Right. So, um, right. So we don't exactly know. Uh, there have also been two Canadian anaphylactic reactions reported last in the last 24 hours. Uh, we don't know. Um, Canadian, uh, both Canadian health workers who had um, uh, severe allergic reactions have not known to be um, allergic before, so they have not known to have anaphylactic reactions prior to this. So whether it's a reaction to the polymer, uh, a preservative or not, we don't know. Uh, you know, or or we don't even know. In fact. Um, which category of people are at the increased risk for the allergic reactions. And to me, at the moment, the most serious problem is just that, is, is an allergy. It's not, um, of course, there's, as we discussed in the past, the problem with the long-term safety. But as I also mentioned, the long-term COVID consequences seemingly are pretty horrific. Um, up to 30% of patients six to 12 months later, or 12, not, not 12, six months later, still have symptoms. So with that in mind again, um, and last thing I wanted to say here is, um, um, it appears that um, more and more societies are saying, while I earlier used to say that if somebody has a pretty strong inflammatory condition that's not well controlled, that you may want to think twice about it, more and more society is saying that shouldn't be a problem. So that basically the only true two contraindications at this moment are the pregnancy and being less than 16 because those two categories of patients were not tested. Um, the rest is really should probably be taken on an individual basis. So if somebody has an autoimmune condition, I think they should really talk to their provider to try to figure out where is their risk category. So, so that's, I think, how we should probably approach this. Typical reaction to PEG. Thank you, Mary. Um, well, it's, it's like any other complex um, allergenic um, substance. So your allergy could vary from very, very mild to quite severe. Uh, the amount of the PEG in the vaccine is small. By the way, vaccine is the mercury free, both of them, both the um, Moderna and Pfizer. And those are the vaccines we're going to get right now. I don't think there's an expectation for AstraZeneca to arrive anytime soon. I, I don't think that vaccine is going to get here in time. Um, in the next, I would probably say a month at least. Okay, next question. Mm -hmm. Do you have to be a resident of a state to get the vaccine in that state or can you get it anywhere? Um, I think each state has their own priorities set up. I'm pretty sure that the only way to get it if you in another state, if you're a healthcare provider and somehow you are vaccinated at the place of work, which is what I just described. If you're a DC so I work, my you know main system is in the D.C. area and I live in Maryland. So so um, the reason I actually didn't get the vaccine quickly, as turned out, was not was only partially because I'm not in the first line, but also because I live in Maryland. So they apparently first were also including D.C. residents. I guess there's from, more from what I understand, um, Maryland, any of the healthcare workers who live in Maryland, but work in D.C., I think Maryland has sent. Um, exactly. Vaccines to DC to take care of y'all. That's exactly. So there's about 80,000 healthcare workers and um, in DC and Maryland, Virginia combined send about 88,000 doses. So that's about 10%. I mean, there's still massive shortage, but at least it's better than, um, you know, what DC, the whole DC got, I think, 7,000 total. Yeah. Um, Nancy, did you answer the next question, which was, do you have dates for the phases? I think you answered that. No, I'm sorry. I don't. Sort of I touch don't. on that. 
Yeah, I, I sorry, I don't have dates for the phases. Oh, okay. I'm not okay. even sure if the dates are available for the phases okay. yet because okay. they're still trying to. Um, they're still this the the priority uh, the priorities for each state are still changing. So. So Lisa's question, there is no question. We're not going to get a choice, just FYA. <laughs> Nobody's going to get a choice here. Everybody will only get a one chance at this, and whatever you get is whatever you're going to be offered. That's it. So the way we got a message from uh, head of the GW was this. This is not a Walmart. You're only going to get one chance at this. If you forego it, you'll not go and get a vaccine until general public. Goodbye. Literally, that's how it came. So that's the reality. So there's no point. I don't even know if I were to be able to choose between Pfizer and Moderna. And it's not really clear if we can even wait for the AstraZeneca one, because um, at this point, Pfizer committed a lot of doses. So chances are most of U.S. is going to get one of those two. And what's the typical reaction to PEG? Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. I think it's like any other allergic reaction. So it's your, it can vary from a probably mild localized skin reaction all the way to a wide anaphylactic reaction. But I, I don't think that it's very, I, well, actually though. So the p reaction to pig is not general reaction. It's not that different like in, from any other allergies. Uh, it's not common. It's a, it's a complex sugar molecule. So sugar molecules, the, the complex mo polymers of sugars are generally speaking much less allergenic than the ones that contain proteins. So, I think, didn't mm -hmm. Dr. Um, Jaffe sort of touch on yeah. a way to get tested before you do the vaccine? Right, so uh, that's not recommended at the moment. I actually don't exactly know um, how easy it is because if you have to do it as a skin check you have to go to the uh, immunologist right? office yeah so you have to schedule the appointment get a consultation and only then come in to do the test um i would assume that it will not be something available for general public i don't know there are some complex testing like a blood tests available for this I haven't really run into figuring out. I think I think what what we'll do is if I have any specific patient interested in it with the history of the reaction, that should be the person to check. I think just checking wild pub population, I think is gonna be tricky because if somebody never had a reaction, does that test absolutely guarantee you're gonna have a allergy to the vaccine? It's hard to say. Uh, okay. There's no, there's no studies or data of any kind. All right. So everybody, we're going to hold off on the other questions. We'll take those after Mara um, does her <laughs> mind-body practice. And um, uh, let's turn things over to Mara. Hey, good Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks. If you really wanted a question answered, <laughs> you're going to have to wait. So um, hopefully this will get you calmed down to hear any additional answers to what's taking place with COVID. So thanks for this opportunity to Dr. Kogan and Janet. It's always wonderful to work with you all. So um, many of you may have practiced Reiki, which is a Japanese ancient healing technique. It provides a lot of relaxation. And we're gonna do an exercise today that is very Reiki related. And I think it'll be hopefully very helpful in providing you with some calmness it's a great technique as well that you can take into the holidays and just keep yourself well balanced as we go through this. And the first thing that I want to do is when I'm working with individuals, I'm working with them to understand their subtle energy system and how that shows up for them. So what I'd love to do is just have you practice a little bit in feeling that energy. So we're going to start this. Um, there's a lot of people on the call today, but I just want to kind of get a sense as to how people might be feeling um, the energy within them. So here's what I'd love you to do is to take your hands. So this is going to be a little experiential. We're going to have you doing some actual activities. And what I'd love you to do is just rub your hands together. Just get some of your hands with that friction going. And everybody is very different and unique in how they feel their energy. So now what I want you to do is spread your hands out a bit past your shoulders and gently begin to move your hands together. Now this is subtle energy. 
So pay attention to what you might see, feel, sense, however it shows up for you. And if you have a moment, just place in the chat anything that you're sensing or feeling or noticing. And if you haven't felt anything, go ahead and rub your hands together again. And let's do this one more time before we go into the practice. Good, we're getting some answers. Tingling on the palms, great. Slight resistance between the hands. Absolutely, throbbing or vibration, good. Tingling throughout your body as it moves down, great. Tingling and waves, excellent, excellent. It's so subtle that you don't even notice it until you notice it. And then this exploration into your subtle energy system is a big, deep hole, rabbit hole for you to go into and also warmth. The other thing you might sense is a density or a magnetic pull. All of these things are ways to begin to sense and notice this subtle energy. And what's amazing is that here in our culture, we often say and talk about our energy. We say we're depleted, our energy is very depleted or we're exhausted. And what we're saying is we don't, we haven't built up enough of that energy. Density, somebody just felt density. So thank you, Jennifer. And so we're talking about this all the time, yet we don't really have a template or a way of recognizing and working with our subtle, subtle energy system. So Reiki is the most passive form of energy work that you can do. We aren't manipulating, we're not actually doing anything, but we are building up the energy within ourselves. So with the great work you just did, we're gonna do an exercise. Here's a couple of things that I need from you. First of all, I can't really see all of you at the moment. So I need you to be sure that you're very stable and secure wherever you are. You can do this exercise sitting. I actually prefer it standing. So in a moment, I'm going to stand. But whatever makes it safe for you, please do. So if you want to stay seated, that's fine. But if you can stand, that would be wonderful as well. So what we're going to do is come into what's known as gas show. And that's kind of coming into the prayer position right in front of our heart area and our chest. And then um, I'm going to actually take you through this first just to show you, and then we'll do it together, okay? And what I want you to pay attention to is that subtle energy, those tinglings or vibrations or warmth that you might feel as you do this exercise. So you're going to stay here for a moment. We're gonna just breathe in deeply and exhale. Then I'm gonna have you separate your hands out. You're going to come above your head. And I want you almost to envision as if you have sunlight, the warmth of the sun, maybe the color of yellow coming down over the top of your head. So I want you to feel that energy flowing. Now, I also was train, trained in China in Qigong. Reiki is Japanese. And so in the Chinese method, they do something very similar with this. They say that as we go down, so I'm going to have your hands, your um, inside of your hands is going to be facing your body. What the Chinese say is to envision your bone structure. And as you do, see any stagnation being pushed slowly and gently down your body. So see that bone structure, envisioning it being released all the way down. And as you do this, you might feel or sense that tingling going down and out your legs. And so if you're in a chair, you're just gonna just gently bend over. In a moment, I'm going to stand. You're gonna just gently touch the floor and then we're gonna come back up again. And this is called something called the rainbow Reiki shower. Okay, I'm gonna stand now. So if you prefer to stand, that is wonderful. And if you're standing, you wanna be about hip distance apart and you wanna be very secure. So make sure you feel solid in where you're standing. And also you might just wanna put a little bend in your knees just a little bend, not a lot, just a little. And everything we do is very fluid. Okay, so if you're ready, we're going to set the intention to begin. 
And what I want you to do is come into gas show. And as you stand here, just take a moment to become fully present. So breathing in deeply, letting go. Our breath anchors us in the present moment. So bring your awareness to your breathing. Wonderful. And now we're going to set the intention to allow the Reiki to flow around us. So now just gently let your hands part and you're going to raise them above your head and just feel or sense that energy starting to flow. You might also envision it again like sunlight coming down and touching the top of your head and spiraling down your spine. Feel or sense that. Good, then bring your hands forward. Again, the inside of your hands facing your body and gently allow it to start to come down the front of your body. Again, the intention is to see that bone structure and pushing out any stagnation. So we go slowly down the body. As you get to your legs, you're going to bend over. Gently touch the floor and come back up again. and feeling or sensing that Reiki flowing. And once again, slowly coming down the front of your body. Bending over. We're going to do it one more time. Touch the floor. Come back up one more time. And again, slowly starting to come back down the front of your body. And this time when you touch the floor, you want to clap three times to release any stagnation. And then take a moment to take a seat. And what I'd love you to do is just come back into gas show for a moment. Again, bringing your awareness to your breathing. Now I breathe in Reiki for my own healing. Healing on all levels, physical, emotional, mentally, and spiritually. Wherever I need Reiki at this time, And as I breathe out, 
I can share the wonderful gift of Reiki, allowing it to flow in all directions to heal. To heal the planet, the people, the animals, birds, fish, and other creatures, the trees and other plants, and anything else that needs Reiki at this time. So take a moment just to feel and sense that as we allow Reiki to flow out, touching all corners of the world. So when you're ready, just gently coming back by wiggling your fingers, wiggling your toes, and gently beginning to come back in. I hope that you enjoyed that Reiki. You can use it at any time. And if you're ever interested, especially when we're in the midst of the winter blues this year, and would love to do a deep dive into some virtual classes, please feel free to join me at Four Directions Wellness. I'll put it into the chat for either Reiki training or we do various classes like a deep dive into the world's ancient spiritual practices and other things. So it's kind of fun to join a virtual community and learn that way. And again, thank you to Dr. Kogan and Janet for this opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, Mara, so much. This was powerful, as always. I don't know if anybody wants to say a word or two about their experience. We, we, can, we have a couple of minutes, and there were not that many questions. Uh, oh, thank you, Mara. Uh, so everybody, Mara put the her practice website in there, and you also can find her information on gwcim.com. Nancy, can you put your um, website in there as well? And, and we'll include all this information in the email that goes out after today's um, gathering. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and I think there are probably more questions, right? Yeah, you had other questions. That's why I... Mm -hmm. um, okay, I forgot where we were. <laughs> One, is, a, is a history of reaction just reactions to vaccines? Um, well, so nobody knows. You know, this vaccine's made differently. So I, I think I already sent a response um, just before we started Reiki that I don't think that the prior history of vaccine allergy means that one would get an allergy to this one. Now that may not apply to the AstraZeneca vaccine if and when it comes, uh, but to this two, which are mRNA, both Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines. So they made a bit different. Their carrier is different. Their preservatives are different. It's the PEG. Um, so, you know, I don't know if it's easy to answer that question. You know, if you had prior history of allergy to the, a prior vaccine, whether you are going to be um, allergic to this one. I think they, they're probably going to ask everybody, do you have a history of prior history to the to allergy to vaccine or to the ingredients? So, but I bet that very few people are aware of what PEG is yet alone, um, whether they've been allergic to it. So I don't know if that's even going to be asked. 
Okay, uh, we have a question about should a person who had a mild COVID case still get the vaccine if they are elderly? So the answer is yes, but you have to wait, I believe, uh, 90 days um, after the COVID. And the concern there is that, um, you know, there's a worry some that if there is still an ongoing inflammatory response, when you take a vaccine, it can worsen it. Um, so it, it's actually a contraindication. If you had a COVID in the last, say, a month, it, you will not be getting the vaccine. You have to wait. But the general recommendation is yes, because the thinking here is that it appears that the, um, especially mild cases of COVID did not provide significant immunity for time-wise, time not, not for long enough, and that the secondary infections have occurred. Now, they've been milder than the first ones in everybody, and some actually have been asymptomatic, but I think the general recommendation is going to be, yes, get the vaccine th uh, three or four months. Don't quote me on that. I don't remember exactly. Is it a three months or four months after the infection? It's a good question. So if uh, someone um, is thinking about getting pregnant, should they wait until after they get the vaccine? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know if I can answer this well. I am actually would be guessing it's the opposite, that you probably want to get it now uh, because you will be immune. But um, I mean, I get the question is whether if there is a fetus in the body of a woman that that is the time to get the vaccine and current recommendation is no. Um, there has been a... Um, you know, rumor going around that somehow this vaccine is going to make women sterile. That, that's just the anti-vax um, conspiracy theory that has absolutely no evidence or any kind of scientific plausibility that that's going to happen. Um, so, you know, so I would think that probably it depends on when a woman trying to get pregnant, but I would guess that it would be more important to try to get vaccinated before pregnancy, because then you have nine months that you, you're not going to be eligible. Next question. Um, has there been any discussion of what uh, happens if some people don't return for their second dose of the vaccination? Right. So, um, yes. Um, first of all, the way they're trying to prevent this, this has been a big concern, especially since, as you all heard, um, the, the chances of mild side effects is pretty high. So anywhere from 10 to 20% of patients uh, of people getting first vaccine is going to get some side effects and upwards of 20, 30% or even more going to get some side effects of, uh, with second. So potentially people who've experienced side effects from the first one may be quite disinclined to get the second one. My understanding is that um, the way they're trying to do this, they're basically scheduling patients for their 21 day, the second shot immediately at the time of the first one. And then they're gonna send reminders. So now, now I, I'm not aware of any mandate. So all of these vaccines are uh, voluntarily and you know, in our institution, it, it's also voluntarily. So if you don't show up for the second vaccine, you, you know, it's the same, they're exactly same. So you're just basically giving up the dose that's gonna to go to somebody else. Uh, so here's another question. Are, do you need a doctor's prescription? Once, once um, people get notified, do you need a doctor's prescription? No. No, okay. it's, it, uh, my understanding is the way it's going to, you, you only, you may need to, you can, I think there's an encouraging to, for the general public, if there's any concern to speak to the doctor before getting a vaccine to discuss possibilities of side effects or whether or not you are at the higher risk for that. But I don't think that there's going to need to be an order. This is going to be, and it's also going to be not done through the insurance is my understanding. I think the vaccine is going to be administered free. What I don't know if if the a vaccine will be free, but what I don't know whether the actual administrative component in there will be free, meaning, you know, they can still charge you for the administering of the vaccine for the nurse's time. That component, I don't know how it's going to be set up. I'm not even sure that everybody knows that yet, uh, meaning 
um, they're probably setting it up as we speak. I mean, they're just dealing right now with vaccinating uh, physicians. Well, just like what, what Nancy uh, you know, outlined, and then there's going to be nursing home residents and staff, et cetera. So it, it, I, those, of course, will all be done at no cost, and the time will be uh, allocated at the facilities and by the institutions that are supervising this. Um, but so once it gets to general public, I don't know if they'll have to figure out how to do it. And I'm guessing there could be a charge based on administration, not with the, but the vaccines are quite inexpensive. I don't know if anybody's seen the costs. Um, they're Moderna and Pfizer are both at about $20, $25 range. The AstraZeneca, I think, is $4. So they've set the costs of these vaccines pretty low. So is there any idea how the states in D.C. are going to be able to ensure that healthy people in the general population are not, that's capital N-O-T, going to be able to cut the line um, in front of higher risk patients? My understanding, you can't just, you're going to be invited. So it's not like you just show up and there's a live line. My understanding that everybody will be given the vaccine by some kind of a list and how they're going to administer it to general public, I'm not sure. I'm assuming you're going to have to show up with the ID. So you're going to be on a list, predetermined list. It's not like there's going to be live lines. Um, at least, Nancy, you may be able to answer this better. I think you spend more time researching this question, actually. You know, I don't have the answer for that, but I'm going to look into it and uh, try to provide that in the um supplemental information I give Janet to distribute. I think that'd be great. I, I'm not even sure if we know that yet, clear. There may not be information on exactly how they're gonna do that. Right. I know the way it's gonna be done at GW, everybody's just like they're calling you and you just, you show up and if you don't show up, you lost the line and you go back to general public um, category. That's what we were told. And we, uh, everybody got a notice. We had to fill out the survey um, and survey somehow automatically was putting people into categories of the priority within the institution. Because remember, I just said for, I don't know, how many, how many, well, we have probably about 10,000 uh, employees at the enterprise. So everybody's getting priority list. And, you know, since we only got, right now it's only less than 1,000 vaccines. So very small proportion of people gonna be vaccinated first line. Um, and I didn't get in the, into that first line. I, I actually don't think anybody in my division of geriatrics and palliative care got on the list, which is kind of shocking because we have a couple of providers that are, um, you know, 65 plus. So I would assume that those should have be got, you know, should have gotten on the first line, even, even if they don't, even if they're not exposed a lot, but just because they're higher risk personally, so I don't know how I don't know how they set up those priority lists within each institution. So, uh, and you know, how a city, how each location is going to do it, but it's definitely going to be by the uh, location for the patients. So for for general public, it's going to be by locations. If you live in D.C., that's where you're going to get it. If you live in Maryland, it's not going to be like you're going to you're going to shop around going to the Walmart to get it in another state. It's just not going to happen that way for sure. Okay. So um, what we were told last week, which was if you live in the DMV, um, make sure to register in three states. It sounds like that you're, that's not going to even be an option. Well, that's because uh, we are within institution. And even though, say, Janet and Lee, you guys not physically seeing patients, but you're with the healthcare facility that offers um, service to the patients. And even though, again, you don't have direct interactions, but you're within the entity that potentially thinking is that you're at somewhat slightly higher risk. No, 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 Misha, I'm talking in general. Oh, well, I don't know. My understanding is that um, everybody, if you're a general public and you're not getting it through your work, you're going to get it by the site where you live, not in okay. another state. Okay. Um, but maybe they'll change that. I don't know. So uh, we have a question about PEG again. Um, what does that acronym stand for and what is PEG? It's a complex polymer. Um, what it stands for, I'll, give me a second, I'll look it up. 
it's a it's a um, polyethylene glycol. So it's a quite common industrial uh, molecule that's used uh, as a polymer as a carrier. So it's used in, um, you know, I actually did not know it's used in the vaccine, but, you know, it's used in a variety of different medications. It's, it's often used in the high dose as a laxative uh, in, you know, certain laxatives have PEG orally. So, uh, but it can also be used for, um, you know, in all kinds of other substances and in, 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 in some substances that are used for injections. Uh, it's commonly also used in um, electrolyte preparation. So like go, go lightly, for example, that's used for um, as a laxative uh, and, and solution to get bowel prep. So the PEG is in a high amounts in there. Uh, it's also the, the um, for the vaccines, the PEG is coupled with a lipid. I, I think the point being is instead of trying to make it soluble in older types of um, molecules, they decided to use this lipid slash sugar polymer. Maybe the idea was that it's actually less allergenic and more stable. Um, I don't know, maybe there, there must have been some, I, I have not gotten into this depth of understanding sort of why this molecule has been picked. Um, you know, but that's probably also why it needs to be refrigerated at the low temperatures. I'm guessing. Yeah, Misha, something. I can actually speak to that. Um, Great, thanks. So Liz. it has to do with the molecular chemistry of these vaccines. And that is also why they have to be stored at such cold temperatures is they're very different than other vaccines that we, we have. These ones are made with RNA and it's a less stable uh, particle once it gets in your body because your body is really good at degrading RNA, right? It does that for a living. It, it pulls it apart and makes something new. That's how you make proteins. So it's actually there to protect them to get in your system so it can get to the immune cells. Otherwise your body would just like grade it right away and the vaccines wouldn't work at all. So I'm gonna take one last question and then because we have a slew of Clark questions, y'all. Um, I'm gonna take those questions, send them to our experts who are now on the screen um, and hopefully they will answer me and I can send that out in the post event email, okay? So the last question um, I want our folks to answer is, what can I do to strengthen my immune system during this time? Boy, um, um, we've spent a lot of time on this question before. Um, at previous, at previous events. Okay. Um, well, let me. But I think the question I'm guessing question is trying to ask. You know, the point here is in preparation for the vaccine. Am I getting this right? Rather than just a general, how am I strengthening the immune system? I don't see that question. Hannah, Hannah, could you unmute yourself and help Dr. Kogan out? Hannah. Uh, okay, so let me try my best. Okay. So if the question meant to basically say, is there something we can do in preparation for the administration of vaccine? I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that. I don't think that we should think about that too much. I think just if you've been generally doing the immune kind of optimization with lifestyle and some of the supplements we've discussed and specific targeted foods, I think you should be fine. I don't think I have much to add to this. Um, you know, I don't really think there's any unique additional nutrients, for example, that you should be taking right before you take the vaccine. Um, it's a still the same kind of package we've discussed before. So I, I think I'll just leave it at that, Janet. And I know it may not be satisfactory answer. <laughs> it's probably the best I can do at the moment. And we also 